for the third session of lecture series as a part of the World Microbiome Day 2021 hosted by the Department of Microbiology and Biochemistry, ISB College. Through this event, we are raising awareness on the importance and potential of the microbiomes for the sustainable future. Now, let us begin the session by seeking the blessings of the Lord Almighty with a prayer. I request Sandra of first year MSc Biochemistry to grace this occasion with the prayer song. Thank you, Sandra, for making to feel the presence of God Almighty. May I now request Dr. G. T. Jacob, our head of the department, Microbiology and Biochemistry, for a welcome speech. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Smriti. Respected Dr. Matthew Abraham, Dr. Daniel George, my dear teachers, participants, and students, a very good afternoon to all of you. St. Berkman's College is celebrating the 100 glorious years of educational excellence. And as a part of our centenary festivities, the Department of Microbiology and Biochemistry is conducting a lecture series. Today, being the third day of our lecture series, we are extremely blessed to have two resource persons. Dr. Matthew Abraham would enlighten us on the topic, current trends and opportunities in microbiology and Dr. Daniel George would speak about bacteriophage and overview. Dr. Matthew Abraham is a veterinarian scientist with a translation R&D experience in the area of infectious diseases, vaccines, and preclinical studies. After finishing his degree in veterinary medicine from Kerala Agriculture University, he moved to the United States and completed his master's degree in parasitology and PhD in virology from the University of Georgia, USA. Currently, he is working as a senior scientist in translation medicine at Merck and Company. I'm extremely honored to welcome you, sir, on behalf of St. Berkman's College and the Department of Microbiology and Biochemistry. Dr. Daniel George, is presently working as a microbiologist in Manus Bio Company in USA. And I'm extremely proud to inform that he is an alumnus of our college with a of our college with a delightful heart, brimming with pride. Let me extend a warm welcome to you, sir, to this function. Next, I welcome all the participants, teachers, and students to this function. Let me conclude my words by welcoming you all once again to this event. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the opening address. So, we are glad to have our resource person, Dr. Matthew Abraham, sir, a senior scientist of translational medicine at Merck Hand Company, who will be delivering the lecture on the topic, Current Trends and Opportunities in Microbiology. Now, without any further ado, we will turn to Dr. Matthew, sir. Over to you, sir. sir. Thank you. Thank you for the nice welcome. I am going to share my screen.
sir uh, unmute your mic sir Okay, so can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you for inviting me. I just want to uh, give a short presentation on current trends and opportunities in microbiology. Please consider this as a less formal presentation because I'm, I just want to walk through uh, my journey with microbiology, just explaining uh, what I have done uh, previously related to microbiology uh, in my graduate school. And also just want to give some information on what are the higher study options in United States after you complete your master's degree or bachelor degree in microbiology or uh, biochemistry from India. So, yeah, uh, I completed my bachelor degree in veterinary medicine from Kerala. So when I was in veterinary college, I, I was very interested in microbiology. You know, many people join a uh, professional school to become a doctor or an engineer. So I was more interested in basic science, but somehow uh, I realized that uh, my plan is not to become a veterinary doctor. I wanted to become a scientist. So I decided to apply for uh, a master's degree after my uh, bachelor degree. I started preparing for it uh, when I was a student. So I completed my master's degree and a residency in clinical microbiology, uh, which gave me an opportunity to uh, work with uh, bacteria, viruses. So I became really interested in viruses and immunology. So I decided to do my PhD in that area. As you know, microbiology is a vast subject. Uh, you study about bacteria, fungus, uh, algae, parasites, and viruses. So it's a, it's a big world. Uh, I just want to share an interesting information. Many of you might have already know about this, that there are more bacteria in human body compared to the total number of uh, cells in human body. So the world of microbes is such large. So this is a uh, paper published in 2016 explaining the estimates of uh, the total number of uh, bacteria and total number of cells. So when you compare that with the number of viruses, it is like uh, many times, many times more than the number of cells. So even within a human body, the number of uh, uh, microbes is such huge. So when you compare that with the environment that you live in, the world of microbes is such huge and many of those uh, bacteria are yet to discover. So this is a, it's a huge world. And currently the uh, research in microbiology is uh, uh, very much advanced because of the introduction of uh, molecular biology and genomics. So now we can sequence uh, most of these microbes. As you know, when the SARS COVID uh, hit, uh, we were able to sequence these uh, entire virus within one month. So that is, a, uh, that is an advantage of uh, using um, molecular biology and advanced sequencing techniques that makes possible that uh, we can work at the level of uh, genome. So this is a uh, graphical explanation of uh, how much uh, is the range of uh, genome size. So when you uh, look at the eukaryotes, it is at the level of uh, uh, 10 to the uh, level of 10 to the power of 10. And even for small viruses like a picona virus at the level of uh, 1000 base pairs. So such a huge range and uh, uh, big uh, mammals or eukaryotes have uh, more complicated and a huge genome size compared to relatively simple organisms or uh, viruses. So now the level of uh, microbiology research is uh, at the level of uh, genomics 
or transcriptomics or even up to the proteomics level you know the central dogma of uh, life that is uh, dna is getting transcribed into rna and rna is getting translated into relevant proteins so at the level of a uh, single organism or bacteria uh, it is um, the research at the level of genomics or transcriptomics or proteomics is the it is what the general microbiology research is mainly focusing and uh, now it has various application in drug discovery and uh, the vaccine development at the level of uh, population it is called metagenomics meta transcriptomics and meta proteomics and also we study the uh, various intermediate substrates or uh, metabolites uh, which are important for the cell metabolism which has the application in cell biology and immunology so you can focus on either the side of uh, microbe or at the side of a host parasite relationship that comes uh, immunology also so this is such a uh, great area that uh, you can focus on so uh, metagenomics has a wide range of application you know there are different strains of viruses even for the sars cov2 there are you, you're you are well aware that there are different strains circulating in uh, various parts of India and various parts of the world. So metagenomics allows us to sequence all these strains and to uh, depict a phylogenetic tree and a relationship between various strains that gives a, a lot of knowledge about uh, how these strains are circulating and what is the origin of this strain. And uh, we can develop a better control strategies uh, based on the metagenomics data. And uh, all these type of research are important in uh, vaccine development too. So when we discuss about the uh, trends in microbiology and what are the areas of uh, research, it's a huge topic. So I don't think that uh, one hour is enough for uh, describing everything. So I just uh, selected five areas. I selected these five areas because these are some of the areas that I worked uh, in my last uh, five, six years. So I can just uh, share what I have done and uh, you can better relate with uh, what are these uh, areas I have included in my studies. And these are something that you, you can also focus on after you complete your MSc and you apply for a uh, PhD position, um, then you will definitely get an opportunity to work in many of these areas. So many premier institutes in India and uh, abroad are conducting uh, cutting edge research in the area of microbiology, biotechnology, biochemistry, and molecular biology. So I just wanted to focus on um, molecular biology and biotechnology. That is uh, most of the micro, micro, microbiology research is focusing on uh, molecular biology. I did my PhD in virology. It was uh, technically molecular virology. We were able to sequence the virus and uh, developing a reverse genetic system for the virus so we can manipulate the genes of the virus to make recombinant viruses to study the function of genes. So we can insert genes, delete genes to study the loss of function and also to develop uh, uh, vaccine candidates by doing molecular cloning by um, expressing a gene into an expression vector and uh, sequencing Sanger sequencing is uh, re relatively easy now. Uh, when, uh, you just need to extract the DNA and uh, just send and you will get the entire sequence in within 24 hours. So such type of uh, uh, features are there and which it makes the research job much easier now. And uh, I want to add a little bit about the vaccine development research I have done uh, in my PhD project and the uh, use of animals in microbiology research. So there are a lot of uh, microbiologists needed in translational research where we use animals as a model for preclinical studies and uh, then using that data to eventually shift uh, the research to humans. So the preclinical research is such, a, such, a, such an important phase before we move to phase two, phase three uh, trials to get approval for a vaccine or drug. So I just want to uh, share a little bit about uh, my PhD project, which was uh, focusing on molecular pathogenesis of uh, J paramyxovirus and virus vectored vaccine development. So uh, the, the area that I worked was molecular cloning and uh, generation of a stable viral vector. And I used uh, this uh, viruses to study viral pathogenesis, immunology, 
and uh, vaccine development. I did my PhD uh, in the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Georgia, um, Athens, uh, in the Department of Infectious Diseases. So you might have heard about uh, paramyxovirus. Uh, so paramyxovirus is a big family. Uh, it is important for both veterinary medicine and human medicine because paramyxoviruses cause uh, disease in humans uh, and animals. Uh, so we might, uh, the, the most important paramyxovirus, I'm sure that you are currently discussing is Nipah virus because that was a, a major hit in Kerala be before two, three years. So. Uh, that, that, that is a paramyxovirus belong to the genus Henipa virus. And there are several other viruses. I'm not going to detail of that. Uh, other important paramyxovirus is measles virus. Um, and this uh, mumps virus is another paramyxovirus. So there are different uh, paramyxovirus, which is, uh, uh, which, those are important for uh, uh, human, uh, human medicine. And, uh, my PhD work was focusing on JPV, that is a J paramyxovirus. So there is a uh, J long virus is a new genus, uh, that is a new proposed genus under the family paramyxoviridae. And all the current viruses belong to the J long virus uh, genus uh, are, uh, 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 they, they are uh, um, having a source of uh, uh, rodent rodents that is that means uh, you, you know rodents that is uh, mice rats and all these type of animals so all these jelong viruses are discovered isolated from uh, these rodent source so this jelong virus is a uh, uh, matter of uh, uh, study in our lab because uh, we found it very interesting because uh, in our lab we were uh, studying paramyxovirus for last 20 years so my major professor found it very interesting to study jelong virus uh, because uh, it has a big genome compared to other paramyxovirus, the genome size of uh, uh, JPV is big. So it was first isolated from uh, a, uh, some mice in uh, northern Queensland, Australia, and there were some extensive hemorrhagic lung lesions in those animals. And in cell culture, uh, this uh, JPV causes syncytia. Uh, syncytia means uh, it is a cytopathic effect uh, when you uh, infect. Uh, a cell line with a virus, then you can observe the uh, syncytia formation. And uh, these are the, the genome structure uh, and major genes of JPV, uh, among which uh, uh, the area of my research was on SH, that is small hydrophobic gene. I spent at least two to three years in studying the function of uh, SH protein of uh, paramyxovirus, uh, J paramyxovirus. And uh, there are other genes like N, which codes for nuclear protein, and P codes for phosphoprotein, and L is a large protein. These all are important uh, uh, constituents of uh, viral RNA polymerase. And G is a glycoprotein, which the virus used to attach with the receptor, and F is the fusion protein, and M is the matrix protein. So just a general overview of the genes caught by the uh, J, J paramyxovirus. And JPV and other genome viruses are isolated from different parts of the world. Um, there's JPV from Australia, and uh, some of these viruses from some parts in China, Africa, Europe, and uh, um, Latin America. So uh, there were no genome viruses isolated from the United States yet. So we found it uh, very interesting to study JPV because of uh, several reasons. One is uh, JPV antibodies were isolated from multiple species and uh, the RNA sequences of JLong virus were detected in bats. Uh, bats, you know, it is a reservoir for many viral diseases like a Nipah virus, uh, even SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2, Ebola. So bats are a reservoir for many um, highly fatal disease for humans. So since JLong viruses were isolated from bats, uh, we found it interesting because in future, if a zoonotic uh, J-long virus emerge from bats, the knowledge about uh, J-long virus will be helpful to understand more about uh, how this virus replicates and uh, developing a suitable therapeutic or uh, uh, preventative measure against this virus. So knowledge about JPV help us to understand more about the J-long virus genus and uh, JPV infects rodents. You know that uh, uh, mice is a 
relatively cheaper animal model. So many of these paramyxo so viruses like uh, mumps virus or measles or respiratory syncytial virus, they don't have a very good animal model and the preferred animal model is a chimpanzee or other non-human primates like a rhesus macaques. So research in non-human primates is very costly. So since JPV infects rodents, we can use JPV as a uh, very good candidate to study uh, the viral pathogenesis. And uh, uh, we were also trying how we can use JPV as a vaccine vector. So I, I want to give some details of uh, uh, three projects I have done. And one is the role of uh, small hydrophobic protein in the pathogenesis of uh, JPV. And other is uh, in vivo gene delivery of uh, JPV vector by creating JPV reporter virus. And uh, the third is the development and testing of uh, JPV based uh, vaccine candidates. About the small hydrophobic protein, it is a small protein of 69 amino acids. Uh, I'm not going to much details of that. So for this project, what I have done is uh, I just replaced the small hydrophobic protein with a green fluorescent protein. So this is the first project that I did in graduate school. Before joining graduate school, I had no experience with the molecular biology. I never sequenced a uh, DNA or even extracted a DNA. So this was such a learning experience for me and I really enjoyed that. So uh, for this one, uh, we used the general molecular biology techniques to replace uh, the small hydrophobic protein with the uh, the GFP. GFP is a green fluorescent protein which emits green light. So you can use that as a marker uh, in uh, many biological research. So this was termed as MA01 because that's Matthew Abraham 01. So in our lab, there is a custom that when you create a virus or a plasmid, we name it in the uh, name of person who actually constructed that uh, uh, plasmid. So that we can trace back to the original person who made that construct uh, even after five or 10 or 20 years. So we have that uh, record available. So after making this virus lacking the SH gene, uh, this is the recovery of uh, uh, JPV lacking SH, but the presence of uh, GFP. Um, so we just uh, confirmed the and uh, characterized that virus. And uh, this is the growth curve. So. Uh, this is a plaque assay. Uh, uh, George Sar will explain much more about a plaque assay because he has done plaque assays in the bacteriophage. So uh, this is a growth curve where I infected uh, vi these viruses in cell culture and collected the media to various time points and did plaque assay to estimate the titer of the virus. So both wild type J paramyxo virus and uh, the JPV lacking the small heterophobic protein, they both they both behaved similarly in cell culture. There were not a, a huge difference in the growth kinetics of uh, the uh, wild type virus and the mutant virus. So I just want to uh, add some new, uh, two new virus into the list. That is mumps and RSV. So why it is important? This mumps, you know, uh, in Malayalam, uh, this is mundi nere. So mumps is uh, is a relatively big issue in the US. Even after MMR vaccine, there are several strains of mumps which can uh, cause disease in humans. And this uh, mumps also has a small hydrophobic protein, uh, which is also a type one protein, just like JPV. And RSV, that is a leading cause of uh, uh, infant hospitalization in the United States and many parts of the world. Uh, RSV also has a small hydrophobic protein, which is a type two membrane protein. So the issue with the mumps and RSV is there is not a very good animal model to study the gene functions. So uh, I have done some uh, additional work where I replaced the small hydrophobic protein of JPV with uh, the uh, small hydrophobic protein of mumps virus and RSV to create uh, uh, two chimeric viruses. That means uh, the same virus exhibiting the small hydrophobic protein of uh, different viruses. So the advantage of uh, characterizing this type of uh, viruses is that this is just a RT-PCR confirmation of uh, the, the chimeric viruses uh, I made. So advantage of this studies is we can study the function of these genes in a 
laboratory ma laboratory mouse model so um this study shows that uh, the deletion of small hydrophobic protein attenuates the virus that means uh, when you delete the small hydrophobic protein the virus is getting less infective or less virulent in uh, uh, animals so there is a role for small hydrophobic protein in virulence and uh, the main reason is small hydrophobic protein is related to the uh, innate immune response that means uh, small hydrophobic protein uh, inhibits the tnf alpha expression in um, uh, cells so you might have heard about tnf alpha this is tumor necrotic factor alpha that is a pro inflammatory cytokine so the sh has a blocking uh, way of uh, uh, small hydrophobic sorry small hydrophobic pr protein blocks the tnf alpha and a related extrinsic apoptotic pathway so th those are some of the in vitro studies i did i am not going to that details but uh, uh, just uh, i wanted to make sure that uh, the role of a small hydrophobic protein is important for viral pathogenesis so this is the main function of a small hydrophobic protein then in the second part of the uh, part of the research uh we wanted to test the jpv vector by creating jpv reporter viruses so it is just to uh, just to study how we can use jpv to deliver foreign genes into animals for this project uh, what i have done was uh, we have inserted some foreign genes into the genome of the virus by using a ires linker ires means uh, internal ribosomal entry site uh, this is the uh, RNA sequence uh, of a picona virus called EMCV, that is uh, encephalomyocarditis virus. So, uh, in short, IRES act as a glue, uh, so it act, act as a linker. So, we can combine multiple genes, multiple open reading frames into the existing gene by using a IRES linker. So, uh, when you create a virus with a foreign gene through an IRES linker, uh, this region recruits the ribosome and uh, the open reading frame that we attach uh, uh, downstream of the IRES region will be translated. So we can express foreign proteins in a viral genome by using this method. So I, uh, ma I made several viral constructs like that. So uh, the advantage of using this is, uh, so this is just uh, the uh, sequence of the virus, uh, just showing the small hydrophobic protein open reading frame and this in red is the EMCV IRES region, and this is a foreign gene luciferase. Uh, so uh, this EMCV region was used as a linker to combine two open reading frame. Open reading frame is a part of gene which is actually coding for that protein. So this is a general cloning technique uh, uh, I did for uh, generating the reporter virus. So the advantage is uh, this uh, nano luciferase uh, is a foreign protein we inserted into the gene, uh, into the uh, virus. So this nanoluciferase is a bioluminescent protein. So it, upon adding a substrate, the nanoluciferase uh, enzyme emits light, so we can capture the light using an in vivo imaging system. So by doing this, you will be able to track the replication of virus in an animal model without even euthanizing the animal. Otherwise, the only way is to infect the animal, then euthanize the animal, collect the organs, and then uh, uh, titrate th those organs to know the uh, titer, or we need to uh, figure out wh what are the organs where the virus is getting infected. But by using imaging studies, without even euthanizing the animal, you can just anesthetize the animal and uh, uh, using an in vivo imaging camera to track the viral replication in a live animal so we will be able to get an idea of what are the organs infected and how long the virus is persisting in the animal uh, so this type of uh, studies is very useful to um, uh, study the efficacy of a drug or a vaccine uh, and how the virus is uh, uh, behaving to the drug or vaccine in a animal's uh, animal model so uh, the main reason we did this study is we wanted to know whether we can use j virus to exhibit a foreign protein so that we can use jpv as a vector for uh, developing vaccines 
So you might have heard about the Oxford vaccine that is the COVID shield, the principle of COVID shield vaccine is like this. So uh, this is a SARS-CoV-2 virus and uh, you just uh, get the sequence of the spike protein, which is the antigen expressed on the surface of the virus and you sequence the protein and you insert that protein into another vector. That is a uh, adenovirus, relatively uh, safe adenovirus. So insert the spike protein into the adenovirus and uh, you, you can use this adenovirus as a vaccine so that uh, uh, this virus replication also uh, produce the spike protein specific antibodies in, in our body. So that is the principle behind a vectored vaccine. So based on my research, uh, I was able to understand that uh, we can delete the small hydrophobic region. And even after deleting the small hydrophobic region, the virus still replicates and the vector is safe and uh, it is attenuated. So I thought about uh, inserting foreign antigens, just like spike protein of the coronavirus, uh, I tested with influenza first. You know, the surface protein of the influenza is hemagglutinin. There are two surface proteins for uh, influenza virus. One is hemagglutinin and other is neuraminidase. So we named the vi influenza virus based on which hemagglutinin and neuraminidase is expressed on the surface of the virus. If it is uh, hemagglutinin 1 and neuraminidase 1, we name it as H1N1. If it is he hemagglutinin 5, and uh, neuraminidase 1, we name it as uh, H5N1. So uh, this hemagglutinin elicits a protective uh, immune response by uh, uh, producing neutralizing antibodies uh, in the animal model. So I just replaced the small hydrophobic region with uh, the hemagglutinin of uh, uh, influenza virus and I did some uh, in vitro studies. This is the uh, expression of uh, hemagglutinin in cells after infection with uh, after infection with the uh, vaccine virus and using a mouse monoclonal antibody against uh, uh, hemagglutinin so i'm not going into much details of that uh, but this is the general framework of animal study that we have done where we vaccinated uh, mice with uh, the ma13 or gpv containing uh, hemagglutinin vaccine and uh, uh, blood the animal to look at the uh, antibody response and then we challenged with the influenza virus in a BSL-3 facility and uh, we looked for uh, how the vaccinated animal is uh, uh, protected compared to the wild type virus. So we found a very good result. Uh, the study is not published yet. Uh, so, uh, but, so I'm not going to the results of this study, but this is a general framework of animal study I have done. Then uh, the second part of the research was using this virus in um, uh, rhesus macaques. So this study was done in another facility uh, in the University of Louisiana. So we have uh, given intranasal vaccination at week zero, week four, and uh, week 12. And this study also showed that uh, uh, in monkeys, the vaccine is eliciting both cell-mediated and uh, humoral immune response uh, uh, against uh, uh, hemagglutin and protein. So my, my, in my PhD research, I was able to work with uh, some other vaccine candidates also. So mainly I have used JPV as a vector and developed um, a couple of vaccine candidates. Uh, and many of those were tested in mice and some of them were tested in uh, non-human primates on monkey model. Um, so those studies are still ongoing. Uh, so this is a general, uh, a general type of work that I have done in my last uh, five years of PhD. So I hope I have uh, covered some of the areas of the research trends like molecular biology, uh, gene deletion and uh, mutation, now, how we can use uh, cloning and sequencing uh, in microbiology research and uh, how the knowledge about microbes will help us to develop vaccines and how we can use animals in microbiology research. So the uh, next portion of my talk, I just wanted to describe a little bit about uh, higher study options in United States after you complete your uh, MSc uh, in microbiology or uh, 
biochemistry or biotechnology. So uh, before going to that, I just want to debunk three myths uh, for getting admission in the US. Those are uh, people usually uh, say a couple of things that uh, uh, that is not actually needed, but people discuss several unwanted things related to getting admission. That is, the, you need a high mark in college to get into uh, a call, uh, get into a graduate program in US. That is not true. And you need a lot of money. That is also not true. And you need a very good English, like a, a very fluent in American accent. That is not true. So these are the three things that not needed for getting admission in the United States. So what are the three facts? First, you don't need a very high mark or you don't need to be a gold medalist or rank holder. Just 65 to 70% mark is enough uh, to get an admission in the US. You just need to clear the cutoff of the graduate school. And the uh, other thing is you not, don't need money at all. You will get a full tuition waiver and monthly research assistantship. So there is no need to apply for any scholarship. You will get a uh, full fund if you get admission for a PhD in the US. The, the, you don't have to worry about money. You will get uh, assistantship and uh, your entire tuition will be waived. And uh, regarding the English language fluency, just an ILTS score of seven or a TOEFL internet based test 90 is enough. So uh, just you need to prepare for two or three weeks. That is enough to get to this English language score. You don't need both IELTS and TOEFL. Uh, just uh, Google on IELTS and TOEFL and uh, what is the test that you prefer more comfortable, just uh, 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 take that test. So how you can apply. So a four year degree is needed. So in basic science, uh, you guys are doing three year bachelor degree. So I prefer complete your masters also uh, because uh, most of the universities in the US prefer a four year undergraduate degree. So if you have completed your MSc, then you are uh, uh, qualified to apply. And uh, 65 or 70 percentage marks is enough. You don't need a 90 or 95 percentage. And you need a passport because the passport is needed to register for these two tests. One is the GRE. You can go to this link to get information about GRE. Um, and um, GRE, you need to prepare for uh, three to four months. And you can purchase some books, uh, Barron's GRE or Kaplan GRE, and you can prepare yourself. You don't need any coaching or anything. GRE is relatively easy. Uh, with the three to four months preparation, you can secure a very good very good score and other is TOEFL or IELTS and then what you really need is a research experience or internship experience so they are not in, uh, looking at uh, uh, what what marks or what numbers or what GPA you have secured in your undergraduate degree they are looking at uh, how uh, you are showing scientific curiosity in your application so you can show that scientific curiosity by doing some small research projects uh, as a bsc student or an msc student you can you don't have to do a big project just uh, some small projects and um, present that in a conference or get a publication out of it or if you have some free time then do an internship in a research institute like uh, uh, indian institute of science or uh, uh, Raji gandhi center for biotechnology so some people after completing their uh, msc do a one year internship to get more research experience that will definitely boost your application. So what they really count is uh, you need to highlight your scientific curiosity by uh, adding some research experience and uh, telling them why you need to do a PhD. So a good CV, a two page essay that is personal statement and uh, I prefer contacting some professors before applying because if you know that uh, a professor has fund to support your PhD or masters, then your chance to get admission is more. So you can contact some professors by writing a uh, clean professional cover letter and uh, two or three recommendation letters from your professors in college. So uh, what I did as an undergraduate student, so I, I did my bachelor's in veterinary science, so it is a five-year course. So uh, my BBC was enough for me to apply for a graduate program because it is a five-year program. So you can do this uh, when doing BSc or MSc. What I did was uh, 
uh, during my third year and fourth year, I did some small research projects. Uh, those were just like uh, collecting some clinical samples from uh, veterinary hospitals and uh, doing some laboratory assays in lab. And uh, I did all these uh, research projects with the help of my teachers in veterinary college. And I presented it in uh, Kerala Science Congress and published it in uh, some science journal. And uh, during my fourth year and fifth year, I prepared for GRE. And then towards the end of degree, I attempted GRE and TOEFL and prepared a CV, personal statement, and a cover letter. And what I did was uh, I contacted almost five, 500 to 600 professors. So I just browsed the uh, university website. I looked for the department faculty profile. I read about the uh, professor's research interest, and I tried to customize uh, email for each professor. I just uh, shortlisted professors of each university, and uh, I read about the professor's research work uh, by uh, reading through the PubMed abstracts, and then a single page um, co cover letter for each professor, and I attached my CV with the cover letter, and I contacted uh, 500, almost 500 professors, and I got a couple of good replies. So based on that good reply, I applied to that specific university. So that is the way that you can secure full funding in the US. Uh, so how you can prepare a personal statement uh, that is the most important part of the graduate school application. It is not your GPA. The most important part is your personal statement and CV. So personal statement is a uh, one to two page document where you explain the purpose of starting a graduate school. So you uh, describe your background and how your background fits with uh, the program that you're applying and you add your skills. Uh, like your research skills and how you prepared, what are your career goals and why? what are your research interests. And also uh, an advantage of contacting a professor is that you can mention the name of that professor in your uh, uh, personal statement. So uh, you can just add uh, the department graduate program or university that matches your vision and any prior research experience with the, the faculty that uh, in that university that is uh, for an international student this is very hard i understand but you can also add uh, any special circumstances awards or publications so that that can make your application more strong and when you contact a professor you need to write a cover letter it is not just like uh, a message that we uh, write in facebook it should be a professional cover letter so it should be less than one page make make it short and succinct don't elaborate a, uh, a lot so these processes are really busy they don't get time to read a, a big email so make it short and uh, discuss what part of the professor's research attracted you and uh, you can also add your uh, test scores and your skills your, your prior research experience and uh, te tell him or her that uh, why you are interested in that particular lab, what aspect of uh, that professor's research uh, interested you. So just to prepare a letter for each professor and um, send. So that is, the, that is what I, I did. So this is a general flow. When you study in your college, in addition to the classroom learning, get some research experience by doing projects. So, uh, th they are not looking at a, uh, big projects or a Nobel Prize winning project, just some small projects, isolating a bacteria or uh, um, just uh, getting some milk sample from a local um, a diary and uh, isolating a bacteria or uh, developing an assay or some small projects uh, like uh, uh, collecting blood sample to do an ELISA, uh, anything is fine. Uh, any small projects that you can do with the help of your teachers that is enough. And if you have time to do some internship in some uh, research institution, that will add more research skills, or you can uh, get some idea about the cell culture or uh, molecular techniques. Uh, you don't have to actually use the machine to get some basic idea about uh, the principles behind PCR or uh, Western blot, that is enough. The, so you can at least show in your application that you know these techniques, that is, that, that is really good. And then prepare for all these tests and uh, get all these uh, documents and then contact processes. That is a good way. Uh, you can also apply directly, but the issue is uh, each for each application, 
that is like uh, 50 to 150 dollars for each university so so that costs you a lot of money so i prefer contacting professors and based on which professor gives you a positive reply like uh, a professor says i have fund and i can support you please apply to my university so that is the reply that you need to look for and then you can apply to that particular school and uh, 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 so for that customized letter for each professor attach your cv and uh, relevant research uh, items in, into that email and then the final stage is apply to that school so by doing this the advantage is you only have to pay for your visa and uh, uh, the, the uh, travel charges other than that every month you will get a stipend or scholarship and you and your entire tuition will be waived so you don't have to pay anything for your master's or PhD, everything is fully funded. Uh, so your professor will be funding you from his grant. So uh, that is regardless of nationality. Even if, if, if you are from India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or America, that doesn't matter. Every graduate student in the US are funded equally uh, and uh, you don't have to worry about money. So what are the specializations? So when you contact professor, you don't have to just to look for uh, microbiology because now the world now the world of research is highly interdisciplinary science is interdisciplinary because uh, uh, i can tell you one interesting thing i did my phd in the department of infectious diseases and uh, there were another graduate student with me her masters was in physics and she was doing phd in virology immunology so that type of flexibility is available uh, in us so even if your background is in physics you just need to get uh, take some prerequisite courses and you can do your phd in virology or immunology so the uh, science is interdisciplinary and uh, everything is connected to everything that is the uh, way of scientific research so just just open all options apply widely look for professors working in um, many departments so these are some of the departments that you can look for biochemistry Bio many professors in the biochemistry uses bacteria as a model for their research. For, uh, for example, uh, when you want to do research on a particular uh, RNA polymerase enzyme or uh, any type of, uh, 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 any type of uh, um, uh, biochemistry, or any type of enzyme or uh, protein function, you can use uh, those uh, bacteria as a model for studies. And bioinformatics is a big, uh, area now because it combines uh, biology and uh, IT. So if you are interested in bioinformatics, you can learn some programming languages like uh, Python or R. Um, so you can do some um, uh, internship. So bioinformatics is a big area and biotechnology you already know. And environmental microbiology is another area where you can look. And genetics, many processes uh, uses bacteria or uh, fungus for uh, uh, studying genetics because the prokaryote is a very good model for uh, many um, uh, genetic based studies and clinical microbiology or medical microbiology is one area where you can look for that is uh, working in a diagnostic lab or a hospital setting uh, so there are many processes working on developing assays for uh, uh, many viral diseases like developing a new molecular assay like PCR or a serological assay like ELISA. So that is uh, one area. And food microbiology is a big, big area where uh, we can use bacteria for uh, fermentation and uh, uh, that is related to the food safety. And uh, many diseases uh, are uh, spread through food. So public health is a big area. And um, the, the spread of disease in a population, uh, you can study that uh, it's epidemiology. That is, a, uh, that is an area where uh, you can uh, specialize after your master's in microbiology. If you are interested in uh, some biostatistics or uh, mathematical modeling, that is the area where you can combine your biology background with uh, mathematics. Epidemiology or biostatistics is a very good area where you can focus on. And molecular biology is a vast area. Now microbiology research is uh, highly focused on molecular biology and even after uh, molecular biology based uh, work in microbes you can you can use that skills in many other research so they are not uh, entirely looking at what type of molecular biology work you have done if you worked uh, 
in E. coli, you can definitely work on some physiology or uh, some neuroscience project because the technique of molecular biology is same. So you can apply those uh, technical skills in your PhD and postdoctoral position uh, or uh, even after getting a job, th those skills will be uh, helpful uh, and can be applied in a, uh, a variety of areas. So there are, these are just uh, five or six topics that I selected, but the area is really vast. I suggest you to use all the uh, social media and the internet. Now, uh, every all information is available in your cell phone. So use this time wisely by doing research on what I can, what you can do after your uh, masters. And there are different areas to focus on just to do research on uh, um, these areas and available opportunities. And if you uh, are interested in US, start your preparation at least one year before your uh, planned application time, because one year is needed for preparing for this uh, test and also to prepare your application. And uh, if you are a BSc student, I suggest you to uh, do some research. It's not just like uh, memorizing your classroom notes and getting marks. They are not looking at this uh, marks or GPA. Uh, what you can do is uh, do some small projects and uh, uh, do some extra reading, work with your teachers to uh, get an idea on what are the new research skills that you can acquire. Go for workshops uh, like a molecular biology workshop or a, um, some immunology workshop. Get some basic understanding of uh, molecular biology, immunology assays. So I know it is very hard to get a hands-on experience in many of these things, but just to, uh, get an idea on the principles behind these assays. So whatever you do outside of your classroom will be more important than what you do inside your classroom. So show that you are really enthusiastic about science and you have scientific curiosity in your application. That is what matters more than your mark. So you don't have to be a smart or a rank holder. You can develop a very good career in microbiology or uh, science in general uh, by just showing curiosity in science. So all the best and thank you. Smriti. Smriti. Thank you so much, sir, for your thought provoking words and highly inspiring time with us. Thank you, sir, for providing, providing instructions and ideas regarding the higher options that we can pursue after our graduation or post-graduation. Thank you so much, sir. Our principal, Father Rajiv Pekurian, has joined with us. On behalf of the Department of Microbiology and Biochemistry, I welcome you, Ajha, to the session. Welcome, sir. Now, the interactive session will be held after the next session. Now, we are moving to the next section of the talk. Today, we are so fortunate enough to have another resource person as well. We have Dr. Daniel George, microbiologist of Manus Bio Company, Augusta, Georgia, who will be giving a lecture on the topic, bacteriophages and overview. I cordially invite you, sir, Hello, Oscar. I am Daniel George, currently residing in Augusta, Georgia. 
I am working part time right now for a small biotech company called Manas Bio here in the city. Dr. Matthew gave an in-depth look at chances and different areas of microbiology as a whole and gave some guidance to all the students for furthering and getting higher studies in the United States. What I'm trying to do is just to go through my experience in industrial microbiology, a little bit where I was working in two different areas. I started my career in microbiology itself after my clinical medicine as a veterinarian in different areas of the world. After arriving in the United States, I got a chance to get into a micro lab in a biotech company, and that's where I started. First, I worked with Monsanto company. As you know, they are the leaders in biotech, especially in the agriculture area, where they have developed a lot of hybrid as well as drought resistant plants for the agricultural sector. Then I went into Eli Lilly's animal division, Ilanco. Ilanco is a company which made different animal products, feed additives, injectables, etc. And they also went into biotech production of bovine somatotropin, recombinant somatotropin, and they have a commercial name, Posilac, for that. This is used for injecting cows to increase milk yield. And for many dairy farmers in the United States, as well as in other parts of the world, it is a blessing, it was a blessing. So before I go further, I just want to know and tell you all about why biotech is so important for the future of mankind. In 2050, it is expected that the human population will reach 10 billion. As you're aware, we cannot expand the natural resources like cultivable land, for example, it's already been taken, consumed already. So the enemy we see in front of us for sustaining, feeding that kind of a population explosion is only through, luckily through bacterial or rather biotech improvements. Biotechnology is a great, great asset and that will be the only tool which can relieve the world from poverty and hunger. That is why it is important. That's why I mentioned now about this. So you are all the candidates in future who will be doing that part as microbiologists and areas of molecular biology, research and development, and producing sustainable food sources as well as other materials for the world. Now, is biotechnology safe? The question arose many, many years ago when it started. And in the USA, definitely we can say it is safe based on the three agencies which look after or rather control that area. United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, is one agency. And then Food and Drug Administration, FDA. And then, of course, Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. These three agencies together control from start to finish. In other words, research development area, like if you're working on a particular protein or a gene, starting from that time onwards to the product, finished product reaching the market. Even after reaching the market, the market surveillance afterwards, they control it. It takes around 12 to 16 years for a product of biotech product whether it's an animal or an agriculture or a food material, anything relating to biotech, by genetic engineering of any bacterial or any other biotech means. That means it is strictly under control and they have not, if they are not shown any adverse effect on humans or animals or the land or the environment, then only they release the material to the market. So biotechnology, we can for sure say, is a safe way of developing technologies for the future. In the current se sector where I work, in the company called Manus Bio, I retired from Eli Lilly in 2015. After that, a small 
emerging company started in Augusta, Georgia, actually by a Malayali gentleman. His name is Dr. Ajay Pare from Moatura. He studied his PhD in Mahatma Gandhi University, came to America and started his postdoctoral studies in um, MIT, where he worked on plant cells and bioengineering. And then along with a scientist, a very well-known scientist called Dr. Greg Stephanopoulos, they found a technology which will definitely reproduce everything a plant cell does in a microbe. Micro. So that technology was patented. And then he started a company in 2011 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where a 24 member research team is in research and development. And then he purchased this company in Augusta, Georgia, as a production facility where I work now. And then we have a part time, it is still on the emerging time. It is still in the infantile stages. We are not full fledged QC microbial uh, microbiology area. We are trying to build one. So I am working in that area and it's a fermentation technology. So we have fermenters starting from shake flask to seed fermenter to the final fermenter. We try to produce different materials. In the pipeline of our company, we have many things fragrances, food additives, pharmaceuticals, all those things are in the future. So currently we are in starting stage. So in any fermentation technology, as all of you are aware, bacteriophage is a very critical event. You do not want a phage infestation in a fermentation technology or a fermentation process. And I'm going to my screen, I'm going to share my screen now, please bear with me. I'm seeing him. Alan Thomas is presenting. Is there anybody want presentation? Please bear with me for a few minutes. Okay, sir. Participants, please continue the meeting. Uh, so we'll join back.
Sir, please unmute your mic, sir. Thank you. All right, this is about bacteriophage. I'm sure these slides, which I'm going to show, is pretty familiar with all of you, but I'm going to just go through this. Uh, some useful information. A bacteriophage is simply a phage, and all of you know it's a virus that infects bacteria. They're obligate parasites. That means they need a cell, host cell, for their survival. And bacteriophages occur in any habitat where host cells live. And all of you by now are familiar with the structure of bacteriophage virus. I'm not going to go into detail. And uh, this is a bacterium. Just for the, I prepared these slides for the sake of our plant workers uh, who do not have much background information about this kind of uh, information. So that is why I put this in these slides. And these are the two phases or infection uh, uh, of this bacteriophages. One is lytic cycle, another is lysogenic cycle. So you are all familiar with that. And then the time factors about an adsorption to the cell until the lysis. So that's the time we have seen these viruses attacking the cells. Bacteriophage, after all of you know this, landing and then attachment or absorption and then tail contraction and then the penetration and ultimately injection. And then the phage infects the cell and breaking it and making bacteriophages. And then the other one is the bacteriophage insert. It's genes in the bacteria DNA they allow the bacteria to live. So in each cell division, the bacteria produce more viral DNA and it contains all information about to make new bacteriophages. This uh, collection of viral genes hidden within the bacterial DNA is called prophage. So after multiple cell divisions, the prophage gives instruction for to the virion production. And then finally, the prophage instructs the cell lies a new bacteriophage is burst free by hundreds. Now, when I'm saying about a fermentation facility, it is a GMP facility. But in spite of all that, there are a lot of chances for a fermentation or a bacterial culture to be contaminated with bacteriophage. Now, a stock culture, when we make a stock culture and lay down a stock culture from the engineered bacteria, which is going to make the desired protein for us. So from that time onwards, by any error of the preparing person or from the environment of the lab, which is doing that, there is a chance for the poor techniques to make the phages enter into the stock culture. And that will enter to the whole batch of the stock culture. And then of course, we use raw materials for preparing media and then in the fermentation and the raw materials can carry these bacteriophages into the system. Inadequate sterilization of equipment, air, media involved in fermentation can cause this. And then procedures not being followed correctly and that can cause problems. And lack of routine maintenance of the equipment is another source. Uh, it is usually a matter of speculation how this enters fermentation, but it can accompany a culture. There's, it can be through soil, water, air, or raw materials. And it is usually the result, result in the destruction of the entire fermentation process. Let us say if it gets into a tank, which is 30,000 or 40,000 liter capacity and the company spends a lot of money to prepare and prepare the media, sterilize the media, the labor involved, and the money spent for the, in the ingredients for the preparation. Considering all that, it is, it's a lot of costly affair really 
to make a full tank of material when we do the final fermentation. So if you have a bacteria or a bacteria, bacteria phage infestation of a tank, usually you operate on the, on the console can really detect it. Early detection by, you know, it can cause excessive foaming, definitely able, not able to control the pH or increase oxygen levels. These are showing that the bacteria are all getting lysed and there is reduced oxygen consumption. So this organism, especially when that stage, if you get a sample from the fermenter and look at the microscope, you can see the broth with the very little cell intact. So usually you will see a mat of debris only. So prevention is better than cure. This is where a facility which makes any fermentation product comes in. The GMB techniques adopted by the companies and the training they give to the employees are of critical importance. Aseptic techniques in preparation of handling of culture media by the lab persons, microbiology department. And then of course, weekly environmental monitoring of fermentation areas for the presence of the phage. Very critical for a company or a biotech firm. And then prevent culture spills. The areas where they do that is not alone in the shake flask time or seed fermentation process in a lab situation. That can cause when the, an operator go and pull a sample from the fermenters or vessels and they bring it out. And sometimes they put centrifuge, sometimes they prepare gram stains. So all those areas when they put that material containing broth and they spill it, that's the chance to get phage infestation. That is why weekly environmental monitoring of fermentation areas are of very important, uh, important event. So if any phase infestation is detected, immediate notification to the area lead and then sudden and immediate cleanup of the facility is required. Decontamination solutions and sanitizers, sewage isolation of the area, these are taken and uh, that will prevent the spreading of this phage. Now, in our facility, we do weekly phage check every week. And the areas we check depends wherever there is some areas uh, susceptible for spills, we concentrate on that area. And then if we use sanitizers, we rotate them. Once in two weeks, we use you know, sanitizers like bleach, the low concentration bleach, sometimes quad compounds. We do clean up the area and the training is given to all the personnel working in that area to clean up and report back. And then we retest that area and make sure the phage is gone. So uh, about bacteriophage, a little bit of information all of you know, bacteriophages are attacking bacteria. And this is important. And in 1920s, uh, physicians used to do this is as a therapeutic actually for bacterial diseases. And it is known as phage therapy. When antibiotics came into picture 1940s, phage therapy disappeared from USA. It is still used in Russia, Poland, and Republic of Georgia. And scientists find it difficult sometimes because when these phage are injected, they overcome the immune response that animals and humans produce when the phage and their bloodstream. So it's not easy, but still some people are using it to prevent diseases. Um, it is again, you know, there are some of the resistant bacteria infections, like that is where the phage can be treat, you know, treated for that particular infection. This is some about a general picture about bacteria phage, all of you are aware of this. But we do a plaque assay in our company and many industrial companies where we have a QC lab. The main function of the QC lab is starting from, you know, documentation, good documentation practices. And then of course, QC testing of the media and reagents. Even if the vendor tells you that through their certificates that this is a certified sterile product or something, we do our in-house testing. We do that growth promotion, population verification, and sterility testing of all materials we receive 
and bacteria we receive. Then store cultures and environmental isolates we prepare. And biological indicators is another fact of microbiology lab. Then bio burden testing of raw materials and finished product. Then microbial specification and testing of water and environmental samples. Testing and evaluation of the fermenter samples. That comes, it's a batch fermentation usually in most of these areas. So we do testing of each batch, starting from pre-inoculation to final product, final sample. And we test the final sample only for adventitious organisms or contaminants. And then if you find that, then you go back and retest all other samples collected from that fermenter. So testing and evaluation of fermenter sample is a very critical part of our QC testing. Then endotoxin testing of water and clean steam. And of course, the last part is stability testing of the finished product. So these are the areas our microbiology QC lab do work on. So this is a picture. And then, of course, bacteriophage testing, weekly testing we do. We do a, a black assay. It is, as you all know, we grow uh, E. coli and give a loan of this E. coli bacteria, which is our mother um, research bacteria from our Cambridge facility. And we keep a store culture of that. And then we make a loan on TSA plate or you know, brain heart infusion agar plates and then prepare or the big samples are collected and they are collected in actually Twistmax self uh, buffer or any buffer is for that matter. And then you add that to this soft agar solution and you, or you already do that in your labs. So I don't have to explain it in detail, but, and then you check it for plaques. In our labs, in this kind of situation where we are starting a company, we do not type these phages or we don't do any further work. If you see I have plaque, you count them, report, and take necessary preventive action for not spreading that from that area of infestation. That's what we do. Mainly, we destroy any positive phage plate or anything associated or touching that, just destroy it by sterilization and cleaning and sanitization. So we do not store any positive samples at all anywhere but we detect it and then take the preventive measures for preventing contamination into our tanks. Once any time a tank or a fermentation vessel is infected with bacteriophage, cleaning is actually the most difficult work. Indeed, a facility can be shut down for more than a month. So that is so critical and then financially so burdensome on the company and the management. So bacteriophages are really very important when you are thinking about a fermentation process for making any protein. So that is what my presentation is all about. And uh, Dr. Matthew has given you in-depth, more detailed microbiological subject-related talk and presentation. I thank Dr. Matthew for coming and doing this for us. And uh, he's a close friend of mine a close associate professionally. And then he was my neighbor here in Georgia until he left to Pennsylvania. One more thing before I go, I want to immensely thank the faculty of your department, uh, especially Sweetie Madam for conducting us for this. I know I am blessed to say that I am two way, it's a double delight for me today. Um, Sweetie's mother's sister is our closest friend in Augusta, Georgia. And Dr. Gigi Madam is my cousin's daughter. That also is a delight. I came to know it very late. But thank you all for including me as a side talk today in this presentation. I am a 1964 student of St. Bergman's College. I'm very happy to say that I completed my pre-professional study and uh, Monsignor Kalasheri was our principal at that time. I stayed in St. Thomas Hostel with Father Thomas Chavra as our warden. So these are sweet memories. And it was a nice um, get together and talk in microbiology area. And uh, I only could chip in a little bit, but I'm happy I'm part of it. May God bless all of us. Thank you.
thank you sir for your valuable time and sharing your insight into this topic we are very lucky to have you sir thank you now it's time for the interactive session if you have any questions or concerns i request all of you to leave your doubts in the comment box or youtube chat box We have a question here. Is there any chance that the fluorescent gene technology that is Matthew sir had mentioned to detect the virus within a lab rat be used in human medicine without harm? Do I need to repeat, sir? No, I am reading it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the bioluminescent or fluorescent imaging is a part of preclinical pre research because uh, before we get uh, uh, into the level of uh, approval for a drug or vaccine, we do studies in animals. That's why we generally apply this uh, fluorescent and bioluminescent uh, imaging. But um, uh, in my current department in my pharmaceutical company, we are a big group of imaging scientists we do fluorescent imaging, bioluminescent imaging, MRI, CT, uh, ultrasound, and uh, PET scanning, everything in animals. So most of these uh, imaging techniques can be applied in humans, as you know, but uh, um, we generally do this for uh, uh, preclinical studies. And the application of fluorescent and bioluminescent imaging is mainly in uh, uh, animals. Uh, so, uh, if, if, if we find that useful, then we de definitely move that to humans, but there are better imaging techniques available for humans. I hope I answered your question. So future plans, mainly with this research, we were, uh, trying to develop an imaging model for virus infection. So this imaging model is widely used in many paramyxo virus research and many even for uh, uh, Nipah virus or uh, SARS coronavirus, imaging is a wonderful tool. So the idea is um, if we can develop an imaging model in a, uh, animals, then we need to uh, use that, we, we can use that model to evaluate the efficacy of uh, drug candidates. So I can, uh, tell you a simple experimental design. So we need to prophylactically administer a drug to an animal and then infect with a fluorescent tag containing virus. And then we can look at how this uh, pro uh, animals, how these animals received the prophylactic drug has uh, reduced uh, the biodistribution of this virus compared to those animals without the treatment. So that is a very good comparison. And the uh, advantage is we don't have to euthanize the animal. So we can use the same animal and we can track the progress of uh, the virus in um, animal's uh, body or various organs where the, uh, the virus is uh, spreading. So that is uh, the main advantage of uh, using uh, imaging. And uh, there are some other imaging techniques like MRI, ultrasound. Those are really good for uh, uh, studies related to the drug delivery, vaccine formulation. So you can look at uh, the various, uh, mm, uh, the viscosity of the injection. So there are, there are it's, it's a vast area. So imaging is a wonderful tool that we can apply for uh, uh, translational research, biomarker research and uh, uh, drug discovery. Um, the next question is, uh, what, what is the role of uh, bacteriophages play in water pollution control. Uh, I think uh, uh, so that's Daniel, Daniel, sir. Daniel, Daniel George, sir, can answer it better. Sir, sir you're, mu you're on mute. Sir, can you unmute? Yes. In the, 
I may I ask the question one more, hear the question one more time, please. What are the roles could bacteriophage play water pollution control? We in our facility, we do not test. Uh, Dr. Matthew can uh, probably step in and tell about this too. Uh, we do not test bacteriophage uh, in the water testing protocol, uh, but definitely we collect any water, stagnant water from the floors, as well as from other areas. If we see any, we include it in our weekly testing. And uh, we, of course, advise everybody not to have any water accumulation in the process areas at all, except in dike areas where sometimes there is a spill occurring or something. We are not including that in the water testing protocol, no. But uh, we only do bacteria, E. coli and all that testing, general required testing. I'm, uh, Dr. Matthew, please, um, I don't know whether I'm answering that correctly. Um, yeah, I'm not an environmental microbiologist, but I have uh, read some papers that bacteriophages can be used for uh, uh, controlling many type of uh, contaminants in water because many of these bacteria in um, uh, bacteria that can be a contaminant in water source uh, can be uh, cleared by uh, uh, phages. So there are so a couple of papers showing uh, how phages are effective against uh, several type of bacteria like uh, strep streptococcus, E. coli, etc. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not very updated with uh, that area, but uh, phage therapy has a wide range of application in controlling uh, many type of bacterial uh, infection. And another question is if there is any use for phage therapy for coronavirus. Um, I remember reading some papers regarding that, but I think uh, it's all a matter of uh, competition because uh, if a phage can effectively utilize the receptor for the spike protein, then uh, it can compete for the receptor. So if, if a phage uh, which is not causing any type of disease uh, or any type of uh, issues which is completely safe, and if that phage can compete for the uh, ACE2 receptor, you know, and uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is the receptor for the spike protein. So if uh, a phage uh, containing um, uh, a relevant glycoprotein which can compete with the receptor, then they can block that particular receptor. So there won't be much receptor available for uh, the coronavirus to infect. So such type of researches are also going on. So that is the uh, that is one of the concept behind using uh, phase therapy for corona. And um, mm, I hope I answered. Thank you, sir. We have another question. Uh, to Daniel, sir. So, how do you see phage therapy in future? Can it replace antibiotics? Um, again, this area of research and development, you know, I'm not very familiar, but from the knowledge I have, phage therapy in good old days started, you know, with the World War time. They used it to treat Staphylococcus infection on skin as well as, you know, now what they are doing in Russia, Georgia and all. The problem is the immuno in resistance by the body when the phage is infused. Now, how this is going to be coming in the future, I'm not sure, especially with the antibiotic resistant uh, strains are developing. Um, I really do not have the knowledge to tell you how it is going to be shaping. Uh, Dr. Matthew, any Chipping anything in there? So, uh, 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 I think phase therapy is a very good way, but I don't think that it can replace antibiotics. Uh, as of now, uh, antibiotics uh, has a wide range of uh, spectrum against, uh, it, the spectrum of antibiotics is really broad. So that is the advantage of uh, antibiotics. But if phage therapy can be generally applied for uh, several uh, bacteria, then there is a future. But uh, I think uh, more research is needed in that area. Uh, I don't think that as of now we can replace antibiotics, but definitely uh, antibiotic resistance is a big issue. So something like phage therapy is a good um, 
good area which can replace antibiotics in future but as of now i don't think that uh, antibiotics can be uh, replaced by phages so another question is uh, regarding phage therapy um, then you sir can you explain a little bit more on phage therapy i'm not <laughs> i'm not a expert well, in phage therapy this is uh, this is again about you know information i received by reading phage therapy is actually when you you find a bacteria and uh, that is not responding to antibiotics and all they tried in sort of places you know infusing this bacteria phage uh, into the body i do not think as dr matthew i agree with you i do not think in the near future at least uh, the phage therapy is going to come to the forefront of human uh, medicine uh, in in the united states of course they are not encouraged right now i don't know how much research is going on i am not very sure about it but phage therapy as you are telling it is a very good area for research in future maybe they can come away with some other uh, you know the using bacteria phage against to viruses as um, you know a competitor for receptocytes and preventing big infestations and pandemics that is a possibility so i am not very well read about this and i we our labs don't do any research at all we are only detecting yes or no right now stage you know in our company thank you so much sir it looks like we have covered all the questions so now i call upon danya cv of third year bsc industrial microbiology oh yeah, we are have a next good afternoon all i take this opportunity to deliver a vote of thanks to all the dignitaries assembled here i would like to thank our beloved principal father reji p kurian for giving us this golden opportunity to organize this wonderful international lecture series as a part of world microbiome day and the centenary celebrations of our st bertman's college thank you father i express my gratitude to father teddy kanyu parambil director of self financing courses for constantly supporting and encouraging our department of microbiology and biochemistry i take immense pleasure to thank the respected chief guest of this event dr daniel george and dr matthew abraham for finding some time from the busy schedule to honor us with their presence thank you for influencing us and guiding us to the sky of knowledge really this lecture was very interesting and motivating and a memorable one for our department I extend my gratitude to the head of the Department of Microbiology and Biochemistry, Dr. G. G. Jacob, for her supportive leadership. I thank the coordinator of this international lecture series, Mrs. Bibi Sara John, for enthusiastically organizing the lecture series. I wholeheartedly thank all the teachers, not only for spending their time with us, but also for encouraging and supporting us to make this event a great success. It is my pleasure to thank the technical department behind this lecture series. Especially, I would like to thank BTV, for they have been live forecasting all the lectures of this international lecture series. I would also thank the anchors of today's event, Smriti Ajay, first year MSc Biochemistry, and Amul Lakshmi Dee, first year MSc Microbiology, for their energetic presence in conducting today's event. I would also thank. Sandra K. Ajit, first year MSc Biochemistry, for seeking God's grace through her beautiful prayer song. I am thankful to all the participants from our college and from other colleges who found their time to attend this informative lecture. Last but not the least, I thank all my fellow students for their extraordinary dedication to organize this lecture series. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your much. kind words.
Now, we have come to an end of today's session. Trigger the patriotism and kindle the love for the country by paying due respect to our motherland. May we request the audience to rise for national anthem. Punjab Singh Gujarat Maratha Dravira Pushkada Bandha Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganda Pujjana Jaladhi Paranda Tava Shubha Nami Jage Tava Shubha Ashish Mage Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mandana Gahe Jaya He Bharata Pakya Ni Gatha Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He Thank you all for being a part of this event. Feedback link is already provided in the chat box and stay tuned to us through our Insta page and Facebook page. Once again, thanking you all. Stay healthy and stay blessed.